Amen. Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Judges, chapter 2. Judges, chapter 2. And we will read verses 6 through 10. I'll begin with verse 6, and please join me on verses 7 and 9. We'll read those out loud together and finish on verse 10. Judges, chapter 2. Verses 6 through 10. Don't close your Bibles because I will be reading a few other verses beyond that uh, as we get into the message. Uh, verses 6 through 10. The Bible says, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for recording uh, things that happened that we may learn from them. These things serve as examples to us that we can uh, see the mistakes of others and, and learn from them that we do not have to uh, do the same things wrong. We can, uh, we can correct things. God, help us to learn more. Help us to learn of you and to love you more, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Something has happened here that the Israelites, just a little bit of background, bring everything into a context here. Of course, they've been delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. They have left the false gods of Egypt. God has shown judgment against the false gods of Egypt. Every one of the ten plagues was a direct confrontation and conquering of those false gods. Uh, every, every plague was directed against an area that these false gods supposedly had authority over. And so when, when God turned the water into blood, they had a, a god of the Nile that they worshipped. And so that was showing that God had power over that god. And there was nothing that that god of the Nile could do to turn itself back into water. And, and so on. So, so all, the, all the plagues there were a judgment. They were a declaration and a, and a demonstration of God's power over the false gods. And so he guides them through the wilderness. <clears throat> they come to the edge of the promised land and they vote not to go in. And so that generation, God says, must die off. And so they wander for 40 years. And everybody except Joshua and Caleb have died off. Joshua and Caleb and then everybody that was 18 and under the first time around is now 58 and older. Uh, I'm sorry, 58 and younger except for Joshua and Caleb the second time they arrive at the promised land. This time they don't vote. They say, we're going in. 40 years these kids have been saying, are we there yet? And Joshua can finally say, all right, kids, we're here. And we're not going back. We're not voting. We're not making the same mistakes that, that your parents made. We're going in and we're getting it. And so God directs different tribes to go to different areas and conquer. And their instructions was to drive the Canaanite people out, to utterly and completely drive them out. Now, if you look at the end, of, and we won't, we won't read that now, but you can look at the end of the book of uh, Joshua. You find out that uh, they didn't; they weren't very thorough in all of this, and uh, they actually turn away from God for a little bit. And Joshua kind of gets them back in line, and says, "You've got to stay faithful to God." And so, as long as Joshua is alive, the people of Israel, the Israelites, are faithful to God. They've settled into the promised land. And they're, they're setting up their lives there. And everything's going well. Joshua's alive. They're faithful to God. And there's elders that are there that were alive. You know, they were kids when they left Egypt. And now they've grown up and they're growing old. 
in the promised land and they remember the things that God did, the miracles and giving them food and water as they go through the deliverance from uh, attacks as they're uh, going through the wilderness. And verse 10 says, also that generation were gathered unto their fathers. That's a, that's a kind way of saying they died also. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And this is a very, very sad statement in the Bible. Here's a whole generation that comes on the scene, doesn't know anything about God. Doesn't know the great things that God had done for their country. There's a whole generation in our country now has no idea that George Washington was a man of prayer. Right. He was a general, he, he, and people think he was a military genius. He got some genius directions and instructions from God by going out and spending hours alone by himself, away from everybody else, on his knees, on his face before God, seeking God's wisdom and God's guidance, God's provision, God's protection, and, and that's where he was, a, you know, our soldiers didn't even have shoes and they were going against the world superpower, Great Britain. I mean, that's who they were warring against. These were trained military and, and our guys, man, they didn't have shoes to put on. How did we beat them? Well, it's, uh, uh, it was our home turf and everything. And by the way, the first thing that the, that the British wanted to do was to disarm us mm -hmm. and take away the guns of the American people so that we could not uh, rebel against their tyranny. And, and so, but and what we don't realize is that our founding fathers, although they may not have been 100% of them Christian, they all did believe there is a God. John Adams said this, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's right. Why do we have so much trouble in our country today? We do not have a moral nor a religious people. And when he said religious, he's talking about the Christian religion. Amen. The Israelites have settled into the promised land And upon the scene comes a generation, doesn't remember, has not been taught what God has done for them as a people. And they don't know God. What happens? Verse 11, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. That word Balaam is plural for the word Baal or Baal. Uh, Different people pronounce it differently. Verse 12 says, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods. Those these are lowercase g's of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. We're not gonna get into Ashtaroth so much tonight, but we are gonna study a little bit about Baal. As I said, Balaam is the plural of Baal. What does Baal mean? The word Baal literally means Lord. And, and, and by the way, let me, let me back up a little bit and mention that whenever you see a small g God in the Bible, or something that is an idol and it is worshiped as a God. Behind every one of these is a literal demon. Yep. And, and so when people, they think I'm worshiping that idol. No, actually that idol is representing a demon. You're worshiping a demon. It is a false God. Every false God is a demon. And so when they go after this, this Baal, that Baal is an actual entity. He's not a real God. He is a demon posing as a God. And so you're going to see this religion. You'll find it in different parts of the world because 
Demons aren't limited to one location, but they will set up a religion over here and they'll say, here's, here's, what I, here's, here's how I want this to be run. And so you find the word Baal in Greek, you find the name Belos or Zeus representing the same God. Baal was also found in Egypt. One of his representations was a bull. And we'll have more to say about that in, in later lessons and studies. This, if God allows, this will be a series. <laughs> uh, and so <clears throat> this Baal, that word means Lord, he was presented presented and represented as the God of fertility and life, the God of prosperity and abundance, the God of wealth. And so people associate, hey, I want to have a good crop this year. I'm going to sacrifice to Baal. Well, which one's Baal? He's the bull. And that represents, and so in Egypt, the, the children of Israel left Egypt Moses went up on the mountainside to have a, a conversation with God. God was giving him the stone tablets. While he's gone, the people have said uh, to Aaron, make a God for us. And so the way Aaron tells it, he throws gold into the fire and this bull comes out. <laughs> it just happened. It's, we, we put the gold in there and, and out came this bull. Um, one of the gods of Egypt that they had brought with them, in their minds at least. So the God of prosperity, of wealth. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. As I mentioned this morning, everything Satan does is a falsehood. He pays in counterfeit money. All of his apples have worms. And everything he presents as a truth is actually a lie. So in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, this is Jesus speaking to the church of Laodicea. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Mm -hmm. These people thought, hey, we're wealthy. We've got it all made. We've got a lot of money in the bank account. And God said, no, actually, you're poor. You're wretched, you're naked, you're miserable. You're even blind. And he said, you need to come to me, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. See, they, the people in that church had gone somewhere else. They had not gone to God. They had gone to a false God, and they, had the, they were under this impression, this, this God that they were following, they, if you'd have asked them, they'd have said, we're Christians. We believe in God. There's a, there's a, a doctrine, a, a teaching that has been making its way around uh, through Christianity for several decades now, the prosperity gospel. If you're right with God, you'll be wealthy. Really, because I think Jesus was right with God and his pillow was a stone. Yeah. You never met Mike Lindell. They could have used a pillow guy back then. He said, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. He said, my ceiling is the open sky. This prosperity gospel is not biblical, they then are following a different God. They're calling somebody else Lord. And in their minds, in their point of view, hey, we've got it made. We've got, we're prosperous. We've got lots of money. And you see, you see some of these churches on TV and some of them on the internet. Man, they got all sorts of money. Look at some of these, these pastors of mega church. Some of them have private jets. What are you doing with all that money? Well, you know, God has been real good to me. Not the God of the Bible. Because you're teaching a different doctrine. Mm -hmm. And the God of the Bible says, uh, I counsel you, you need to come to me. 
But the people have gone to a false god and they've pursued the god of prosperity and they think because I have I have a high dollar car, I have a high dollar house, my kids are in private school, uh, we've got the latest fashions of clothing, whatever, we're doing really well. And God said, no, not really, you're not. And so the Israelites get into the promised land. A generation arises that doesn't know God. I've said before, nature abhors a vacuum. They said, we need a God. And their neighbors said, you can borrow ours. Well, what's he in charge of? He's in charge of prosperity. Do tell. I could use some of that. What's his name? Baal. What's his symbol? It's a, the strong bull. And they said, sold. We'll take him. Oh, but we're running a sale right now. When you take Baal, Ashtaroth comes along too. We'll study, Lord willing, study more about her next week. I want us to look at one more scripture here because I'm just setting up a little bit of foundation tonight. We're going to go line upon line and precept upon precept as we, as we march forward. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 12, while you find that, I want to tell you about another country that was founded upon God's laws and God's principles. See, the Israelites, while they're wandering through the wilderness on their way to the promised land, are receiving the very words of God through the hand of Moses. God is saying, Moses, write this down. And then God himself is directing Moses to write things down. And God used Moses as a pen to write the first five books of the Bible. And, and so then they have, you can look through uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and and. Within those books, you have the law of the land for the nation that God set up, the Israelite people. Oh, a few years later, and by a few, I mean a few thousand, people left a continent called Europe, and they came here as missionaries to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, the words of God, to a people that had false gods. And the people here received that word, got saved. A nation was built based on the words and the laws and the precepts of God. The idea of people being able to vote came from somebody visiting a Baptist church and seeing the people are voting and each person gets one vote, including the pastor gets one vote. They said, that's a good idea. We could run a country that way. And John Adams said, you can, as long as it is a moral and religious country. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 12. We'll start in verse 38. Let me get on the right page myself. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So he's, he's already, they've already accused him, you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, which is also another name for Baal. Mm -hmm. He said, well, if that's the case, the house divided against itself can't, can't stand, it's going to fall. So if it's not by Beelzebub, then God sent me. God has shown up to you today. And so then they said, well... Show us a sign. We want some proof from you. So certain of the scribes and Pharisees answering, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, 
a greater than Jonas is here. Mm. So understand this, Nineveh, one man, Jonah goes in, hateful preacher. He hated the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. He said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said, God, kill them and send them to hell. I'm not going there. I'm going this way. And God said, well, there's a whale over that way, but you go ahead. And he, he did. He went ahead and there was a whale for him. And Jonah got swallowed by that whale, stubborn, three days and three nights in the stinky inside guts of a whale. And finally he said, um, if that offer's still available, I'll, I'll go ahead and go to Nineveh. He went to Nineveh, he preached. Everybody in Nineveh got saved. He, he camps out on a hill overlooking Nineveh, overlooking Nineveh, waiting for God to destroy it, and God didn't destroy it, and he gets upset that it didn't happen. And he said, hey, Nineveh repented, and they're going to judge you because there's somebody better than Jonah, there's somebody greater than Jonah here in your midst preaching to you, and you're not repenting. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. He said, hey, there's a, the queen of the south. Heathen, godless queen came to seek the wisdom of Solomon. There's somebody greater than Solomon and you don't want to hear from him. You don't have enough sense to come to Jesus and ask for wisdom and guidance. Verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> Look at verse 41. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Let's go forward to verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. Back in the book of Judges, a generation arose that knew not the Lord. This is a whole people. When it says a generation arose that knew not the Lord, that means the whole nation of Israel, they didn't know God. And Jesus is saying, this whole nation is going to be judged. It's going to be judged by the people of Nineveh. It's going to be judged by the queen of the south. Because you've got a better preacher than Jonah. You have one that loves you in your midst. You have one that's wiser than Solomon that loves you in your midst. And you're not following. A whole generation. He's talking about a whole nation of people. Something has taken them. They have forsaken God. Now, when the Israelites came into the land of Canaan, the promised land, they were to push the people out. They were to destroy the gods that were there. But a generation arose that did not know God. In other words, a generation that there's no God. Everything has been pushed out that was dirty and filthy and wicked. The evil spirits... And they've gone through the dry places and desert areas. And then he said, I'm going to go back home. And when he came back home, what did he find? When he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. He said, whoa, it's empty. It's all fixed up. It's been cleaned. It's swept. It's been decorated. I'll be right back. 
And verse 45, then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, it sounds like he's talking about an individual. Here's an individual. A demon has been cast out. And the demon goes away and goes wandering. And the individual cleans up his life, but he doesn't really put anything in its place. He doesn't have God in his life, in his heart, in him. And when the demon comes out, comes back, he says, well, that guy cleaned himself up. He quit drinking. He quit fooling around. But he's empty. And he looks at that fellow and he says, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get seven of my buddies. They're going to like this. And it looks like it's talking about one person. And, and yes, that can apply to one person, but let's read on. So let's read verse 45 again. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. He said that's the way it's going to be with this whole nation. It was a nation founded on God's words. They had come in and they had driven out the evil spirits. And then a generation, the whole nation, forsook God. And those demons start coming back. And the first one to come back was Baal. The first one we saw mention of. The, the a, a generation arose in Israel that didn't know about God didn't know all the great and miraculous and mighty and wonderful things that God had done for them in bringing them up out of the land of Egypt and bringing them into a land where there was fields that they didn't plow and houses that they didn't build and, and just a, a, a land of flowing with milk and honey and blessings. And they forsook God. And the demons that had left, well, they said, don't see anywhere to settle here. Let's go back. And the first one back was Baal. And he found it swept and cleaned and decorated. He said, I'm going to be bringing more in. I'm bringing Ashtaroth. Hey, wouldn't you like some prosperity? Yes, we would. You've come to the right place. That's my department. Well, no, it isn't. But that's how he presents himself. There's another country, as I said, that was based, built, and founded on the Word of God. It's this one, the United States of America. A couple presidents ago, President Obama said, this is not a Christian nation. We have, Overall, and they, nobody from the outside world would look at the U.S. and say, that's a Christian nation. Nobody would look at the movies that we are exporting. The, the, there's more pornography made and produced here than anywhere else on the planet. There's nobody that's going to look at this country and say, wow, what a beacon of Christianity. See, at one time, at one time, this country was publishing more Bibles. This country was putting more missionaries out on the field. This country was putting more money into the gospel reaching the rest of the world than any other uh, five countries combined. And we were unstoppable. Nobody wanted to mess with the United States of America. Now, you can't go anywhere with people without people saying, we hate I mean, there is a despising. You go to uh, south of the border. Now, they all want to live here. But they don't care for Americans. I, I got cussed just for, and, and I said, hey, I was born here. But your parents are Americans. They're the, they never just said gringo. It was gringo and then other words, afterwards. And, and I, I, I won't say them 
because you can look it up on Google Translate, find out what I'm saying. I'm not going to cuss from here much. How do we go from there to where we are now? A generation rose up that had forsaken God. What's the first one that came on the scene? We'll look more about that. I'll present to you it's very possible it was Baal. If it was Baal, there's certain things we would look for. If we see those things, pretty much is that. We have a country that has forsaken the God of its fathers and gone after other gods. And they've moved in. And they don't come back by themselves. One comes back to get his foot in the door. And once that's, that's there, he starts opening the door and the others that are worse than he are now able to come in and take up residency and start wreaking their havoc so that the latter state is worse than the first. What happened in Israel? They forgot God. Generation didn't tell the next generation, this is God. Back in the 1960s, our government said, no more Bible reading in the public schools. No more. No more. You can't read the Bible in school. And yet, the man who founded our public school system had this to say. He said, when we quit using the Bible as the main textbook, in our schools. Then what will happen in our society is we will overrun our budgets with the building of prisons and law enforcement. And our prisons are bursting at the seams. And it's coming down to the place where you, that guy only killed one person. Go ahead and let him go. we got to make room for people that have done some real crime. We've got to shorten some sentences. We've got to you know what? These things, we've got to decriminalize drugs because there's a lot of drug addicts and drug sellers that are in there. We're going to have to put them back on the streets to make room for the real criminals. And so they're redefining crime so that they don't have to put so many people in prison. Well, you know, the solution isn't to redefine crime. The solution is let's get the Bible back in the school. Mm. Let's get our generation back to knowing who God is, that there is a God, and how he can be identified. Without the people first turning to God, Washington's not going to. It's, it's just not going to happen. God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face. He said, that's when things start to change. It's up to God's people for the remnant to seek God and seek his will. Let's stand and we'll close with a word of prayer tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for recording these things for us that we may learn what happens to a country when they turn away from you. But God also, we thank you that the fact is there's opportunity for nations and countries to turn back unto you and for revival to take place. And Lord, we ask for that and we know you're, you're able, more than able to do so. So we ask for it. May it begin in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our homes, our families, that we may be sure to pass on to the next generation the reality of you. That they may first believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. As we leave here tonight, we ask for you to take us to our home safely. Return us at the appointed hour, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.